with the a agency and works out of Sessions Woods. And she'll be monitoring the chat, helping with some questions and making sure that questions that are asked in the chat box are covered by the end of the presentation when we have some uh, a longer period of time for questions and answers. So if you're unfamiliar with how we work the webinars, we ask that you keep your audio and video muted and that if you have any questions at any time, you can go ahead and type them into the chat box. To find your chat box, it should be on your toolbar, which would be at the bottom of your screen. And you would be able to see an icon that says chat with a little voice bubble, or you might have three dots that say more. And if you click on that, you would be able to see a selection for chat. So again, if you have any questions or any problems, by all means, use the chat. Uh, Laura will be monitoring it, and I'm going to turn it over to Kyle at this time. Kyle, you will have to unmute your, your microphone. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so thanks for having me on, Sue. Um, so iNaturalist is a free app. It's Well, it's an app. It's also, you can access it from your desktop computer. It's kind of just like an online web page. Um, that connects naturalists from any level, someone who's never even opened a book to figure out, you know, what kind of tree they're looking at to, um, you know, some of the worldwide experts in uh, particular organisms. So, uh, let's see. So iNaturalist, I'm, this is just straight from their, from the website here. It is a place to record and organize natural findings, meet other nature enthusiasts, and learn about the natural world. Their goal is to encourage participation from all kinds of nature enthusiasts. This includes uh, hikers, birders, hunters, anybody who's going to be outside um, looking at the natural world. And one of the great things about that kind of community concept is you're getting different viewpoints and different expertises from nature. So some of the observations you might think of a hunter when they might uh, be out making observations, the things they're going to key in on and the things they're going to be interested in might be different than someone who is um, out looking at the birds. So really anybody out in nature can can find a use for iNaturalist um, and we're going to kind of get going and, and see how you can start using iNaturalist um, with just either your cell phone or your computer. Um, but one thing we can talk about first is what is the DEP's relationship to iNaturalist? And really the DEP is just another user of iNaturalist. There's over a million users uh, on the iNaturalist platform and 150,000 of those were active in the last 30 days. So it's a thriving community of people and organizations. Um, so iNaturalist doesn't belong to DEEP. DEEP is just a user and, and utilizes um, the, what iNaturalist has to offer. Um, specifically, our outreach program is using iNaturalist uh, and we're making different projects as we go. And our goal is to promote engagement um, with the outdoors in Connecticut. So we wanna get people involved of all different ability levels. We wanna create a bunch of different projects that help stimulate people's interest and get them, get them outside discovering the outdoors. Um, if you already have the iNaturalist app, you can search for our username. It's CT Fish and Wildlife. And that's kind of the same username you'll find us um, in on Facebook and on Instagram as well. And I think Twitter too. So getting started with uh, iNaturalist, you're going to have to create an account. It's a free account. You know, you'll just, you know, put in your email address. You'll make up a username um, and then, you know, password. And that's it. That's all you have to, to do to, to begin to create an account. Um, then you'll go out into the into nature, um, take some pictures of something. It can be with your cell phone. It could be with um, a different hand, a standalone camera. And then you would upload those pictures either through the app on your phone or from your from your computer um, and upload those to the world. <clears throat> So some of the things that you can do on iNaturalist, it's more than just adding observations um, or being a part of projects. Besides those two things, which are really key parts of it, you can create your own projects. And projects, there's two different kinds of projects. And I'm going to give us a tutorial um, in a little bit. On the, I'm going to go to iNaturalist and I'm going to walk us through how to join projects, how to do the different things on the iNaturalist platform. 
Um, so you can create projects, you can identify other people's observations because I know when I go outside, not everything I see, I can tell what it is. So there's a lot of observations that I share on iNaturalist that I don't really know what it is. Uh, and I depend on the other 1 million users to help me figure out what it is. Um, it's also a great place to explore data. If you're ever curious where a certain species of animal gets reported from around the country, around Connecticut, or around the world, you can look up that type of animal and it'll show you where all the observations have come from. And then it's a great place to actually connect with other naturalists from around the state or around the world. Um, since I started using iNaturalist, there's been other people that I've connected with um, and shared observations and shared experiences uh, about some of the species that I've seen. So there's a lot that you can do on the program. Um, so getting into the projects that the DEP is doing, our outreach program, um, we have what's called an umbrella project. An umbrella project is one bigger project that tracks a bunch of smaller projects all underneath it. So our umbrella project is Discover Outdoor Connecticut. And you can look that up if you're on iNaturalist, you can look up Discover Outdoor Connecticut and you'll find our umbrella project. And when you join that project, it'll let you see um, the different collection projects that we have going on as well. Um, three of the collection projects that we have, we've got a couple more coming, but one is the CT Wildlife Central. And that's a place, that's a collection project where you can um, submit observations of any kind of wildlife, plant or animal that you find in Connecticut. Whether you know what it is or not, it's a place, it's a project that you can upload your, your sighting to and it'll be, it'll be a part of our project. We also have a couple other more specific projects that will target um, different kinds of um, enthusiast communities. So one is our, our backyard bee quest and that came from our shorter pollinator bioblitz. That happened back in June, and we had a lot of interest in the, the pollinator bioblitz that we created this longer term project called the Backyard Bee Quest. So that's a project you can join, and all of the, bee, uh, the bees that you see can be a part of that project. And then we also have the Sessions Woods Wildlife Management Area Checklist. And that's a project um, that's centered just around wildlife, the wildlife management area in Burlington. And any observation of plant and animal can be added to that checklist. So that is a great way for us to keep track of the different uh, of plants and animals that people are observing around Sessions Woods. We're gonna be adding a lot more wildlife management area checklists as a way to keep track of what people are actually seeing out in our wildlife management areas. So we're really excited about that. Um, each of those projects, if you want to join them, you would have to join separately. And I'll show us how I'll show you how to join projects um, in a little bit. But those are our current projects, and we're trying to uh, find ways to get people more engaged. Um, and that's how we're going to get started with just those. So um, we're going to jump over now to iNaturalist and do a little tutorial. We're going to go through the steps um, of, of adding observations from your phone and then from the desktop. Um, and then the ID process, how to join projects, how to create projects, and then messaging other members. So let me jump screens here. All right, so. Here is our iNaturalist homepage. This is our user account, CT Fish and Wildlife. And when this is from our user homepage. So when you create an iNaturalist account, it'll come up to your homepage when you log in. Um, so to begin, there's actually a lot of cool tutorials that you can watch as you start to get used to the program more. And we're gonna go to the video tutorials here under more. And I'm just gonna show you one quick uh, video tutorial, um, but this is also a place that you can watch a lot more tutorials on to get better at the program. The one that I think is probably worthwhile for everybody to watch is just a quick minute, um, and it's making observations using a mobile app. Because I can't show you the steps on my mobile phone while we're doing this, uh, this is a good alternative. So it's going to play this. Okay. And 
Okay, let me just make sure that audio is working. Sue, can you hear this? I cannot. Okay. Can you one your um, speakers up all the way? Yeah, let's see. Are you talking on a headset? No, I got it. I just had to adjust something in the uh, screen share option. Fungus, give me an observation. Okay, so you've installed the iNaturalist app and created an account. Time to get outside and record your first observation. Here's how to do it. Any living thing, like a plant, animal, or fungus can be an observation on iNaturalist. Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap Observe and take a photo. You can review your picture, then hit Next if it looks good. To identify it, hit what did you see. If you have an internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest 10 visually similar species and often a common ancestor. You can choose one of those or search for a species name. On this observation detail screen, you can add more photos of the same organism or write a note. The date, time, and location have been automatically added. You can also change the geo-privacy of the observation, mark whether it's captive or cultivated, or add it to a project. Once you're finished, just hit share and your observation will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. That's it. Keep on exploring and sharing. <clears throat> okay. So, Besides this one video tutorial, there are several others that you might find really useful depending on um, how you're going to use the app more often. Um, so I would encourage you, I'm not, we're not going to go through and play them all, but I would encourage you to check some of these videos out if they are of interest to you. Um, so one of the other things that we're going to do, and I'll be able to show you, is adding an observation from the computer. Not everybody's going to be able to do it from their phones, maybe it's just don't have the interest or if you're like me and you take pictures with uh, a camera you need to find a way to upload those to iNaturalist so I use I use my my computer to do that and so I'm gonna go to upload here and you can click and drag a file and I will drag a file over in a second All right, so I've dragged an image file over, some kind of B. And what it automatically does, it'll give you the date and time of, of the image when it was taken. So for the most part, with our, our phones and our cameras, it'll have a timestamp already on it. Um, but one thing you want to make sure is you just want to double check the location and the time and date if that actually is when you observed it. Double check it. Um, and then say you don't know what it is. I actually don't know what type of bee this was today. Um, so under species name, it's going to actually load a bunch of suggestions. And it, load, it could identify that there was a bee on there. And then you can kind of scroll through and look at the different suggestions that it might be. You can click view. It'll show you a couple different visually similar options. Okay, but say I'm still not sure, say this one doesn't look that similar to what I, what I see. None of these really look that similar and all I'm really sure is it's a kind of B. That's okay. Just click B and that's it. Then you'll hit submit observations. If you have multiple pictures, you can drag them right on top of this other one and they'll get loaded into the same observation. Um, if you want to add it to certain projects, you can type in the project here. Um, 
if you have if you've already joined a project though the project you're looking up it won't come up so i was going to add it to the b project but it's already i'm already in the b project so it won't come up there um, but you can search for other projects to put it in there when you've finished adding the observation you can hit submit Normally it doesn't take this long for one picture, but all right. So then it takes you automatically to your list of observations. So these are the different observations that we've made on this account, um, different trees for the most part. Um, but now the bees, that bee is that listed up here. One of the things you'll see in your observations is it says it needs to be identified. So I put an ID of B, um, but more people in the iNaturalist need to come up with a better ID before it becomes something like you see down here that's research grade. Research grade, all right, observations that have date, photo coordinates, and community supported ID. That means that enough people in the iNaturalist community have agreed on what they think this species is. In this case, it was an eastern white pine. It's a pretty obvious species. Um, that's what we initially identified it as, and that's what um, another community user identified it as. So it's now a research grade observation. So all those observations go into our projects that we have. And here's where we're going to take off from there. So Discover Outdoor Connecticut is our umbrella project. I mentioned the umbrella project earlier. And that is the project that sort of encompasses the other collection projects that we have. And these are some of the other collection projects that we have going right now. The Backyard Bee Quest, our Pollinator Bio Blitz, that one ended back in June, um, but it's still gonna be up here on the leaderboard here. And then our new um, Wildlife Central, that's the kind of the, the, our central hub for sharing wildlife observations with us. So those will get counted. And when you're viewing uh, an umbrella project, you can, see some statistics about it, the number of observations that have been contributed to it, the number of species that have been recorded, the number of people that have um, offered identifications, and the number of observers. You can also filter any project, um, any umbrella project, by the number of observations, the number of different species that have been seen, or the number of observers. Depending on the privacy settings of any observation you make, um, it'll also come up and show a rough pinpoint of where the observation was made. So where different things are being seen. And then our, our um, project, our umbrella project also has what's called a journal. So any status, any updates that we have for the project will get posted down here. So let's go to one of these individual projects. Let's go to the Backyard Bee Quest. This is kind of a fun project that we started after the pollinator bio blitz because we had a bunch of people that were interested in um, in the in continuing to do that kind of project. So we've got all these people who have joined the project and have contributed some observations. Um, so it'll give you some statistics. If you look, the pro the bee that we just put up got automatically added to this project, and it gets automatically added when you join a project. When you join a project and you add an observation that fits the project's criteria, in this case bees, it'll automatically be added to that project. So that's kind of our collection project here. How do you actually join a project? Let's find some other project to join. Um, Vermont has a, uh, let's see, I'm going to go to projects here, community projects. Here's a place to search for all different kinds of projects, not just ours, but any project that's going on. There's obviously projects that are going on outside of Connecticut, but still encompass any Connecticut observations. So let's find something um, like animal tracks. So the North American Animal Tracks Database, that's a project. As you can see, it's got 36,000 observations, 1,000 different species, and it'll describe what the project is. So the purpose of this project is to track uh, wildlife observations from 
skilled trackers. Um, so if you find any animal tracks out in the woods, you can add them to a project like this. You might have to join the project um, like you would ours right now, the ones that we're hosting. You do have to join those projects by um, clicking a button like right up here, join this project. I'll tell you a little bit about it. And then, yes, you want to join. So that's the steps for joining a project. You can do those for the ones that we've created already. You can't do it from this account because it's already, it created the project, so it's automatically in them. Um, but again, under community, you can see the difference, the different projects that you can be um, involved with. So here's one of the other wildlife ones. This was one that we just started. Uh, as you can see, it's only my, from my personal iNaturalist account, um, what we've gotten started, but that one just began. Um, so let's see, the next thing I wanna talk about on iNaturalist is actually identifying things. Um, so if you go to identify, Remember I mentioned you can add things without really knowing what they are. And in that case, they go into this big pool of observations uh, that needs to be identified. And so when you click identify, the big pool of observations comes up and this is a whole list of tons of pages, over half a million pages of things that need more people to identify them. But I'm not an expert on pretty much anything I see right here or an expert in much of anything at all. Um, so what you can go to though is you can filter certain species that oh maybe you're pretty confident in knowing them so let's look at owls in Connecticut actually but owls in New England and it'll pop up as a region the link for OWL, update search. So I'm pretty sure I could probably figure out, identify a bunch of OWLs, at least from New England. And so as you go through and you're looking through some OWLs, here's one. Yep, to me that looks like a barred OWL. It was some point in, in New Hampshire. So if you wanna add an, identif an identification, you could go down here and click add ID or if you thought of something different, you, but you, or you could just click agree. Just waiting for it. All right, so then it pops up, CT Fish and Wildlife suggested an ID. So now this identification is becoming research grade. So it's, it's no longer needs more, more identification from people. So you can toggle through and, and jump through, those are owls. Let me refilter this. All right, so another owl, looks like a barred owl to me, you can hit agree. So this is what a lot of iNaturalist users who just wanna help people identify things are going through. They're finding different taxonomic groups, groups of plants and animals that they're pretty familiar with um, and helping people get more positive IDs. So for the example of that bee that I just posted earlier, I wasn't sure what kind of bee, some bee expert uh, or someone who's a lot more confident in their identification of bees is going to do what I just did for the barred owl. So that's a really important part of this process because it's great for helping people who uh, aren't sure of what they're seeing learn about the different plants and animals around them. So it's a pretty cool process. Again, you can filter out pretty much anything you want if you want to look up um, observations of things. Another thing you can do is come over here to explore and you can explore data from anywhere on iNaturalist. So if you want to look up a certain species and know where this species has been reported around the world, it doesn't have to be a, a species you find in Connecticut. Um, let's look up American bison and it's going to pop up with all the observations of American bison that have come in. 
we can filter it down to different things, maybe ones that just have sounds or sort of just, just photos, um, maybe ones that are just in the last couple of months. So you can explore data on almost any species. And I mentioned sound just a minute ago. You can also do the same stuff with pictures, uh, sounds, or if you have enough of a description, a, a physical description, you can get by um, adding an observation without uh, a photo or a sound. If you're going to add a sound, you're going to do it the same exact way in the uploader. Um, and uh, you'll be able to have people help you identify sounds. So you, you're outside at night and you hear some noise you can't recognize, this is a great place to add it um, and have people help identify it for you. Um, let's see. Next on the list is actually creating projects. As an iNaturalist user, you can create your own projects. If you have a really specific or really general type of thing that you want to um, be able to collect information about a bunch of different things on, you can do that. So to create a project, you can go to projects and right here, start a project. It's going to show you the two different options uh, that I described earlier, collection projects and umbrella projects. Um, but for the most part, if you just want to create a project, say you're really interested in red-tailed hawks and you want to do a project and collect all the red-tailed hawk observations this month, from around the US, you can do that really easily with a collection project. So we'll make that real quick because you don't have to be, you know, a, the DEP to make a project on iNaturalist. Anybody can do it. So let's look at July red tailed hawks. down here with observation requirements. In order to be counted in the project, you have to kind of give it the criteria. Otherwise, anything can be added to the project. So we just want red-tailed hawks. And a date range, July 1st to today. Now, it'll, there's a couple other important things. One is whether you make this project for project members only, which is how our projects right now are set up. And that means that your projects, your observations won't be added to the project unless you join the project. Otherwise, any observation that fits this criteria of a red-tailed hawk in July will be added to the project. And so there's two, there's a reason to do that and a reason not to do that. One reason to make it project members only is to make it more of an engaging experience for those people who want to be involved in a project. But say you're not interested in all of the people being involved, you just want to get all the observations you can and summarize some data by yourself, you might leave this unchecked. I'm going to leave it unchecked right now and I'm going to preview all the observations. So now throughout the world, red-tailed hawks have been observed 940 times on, reported on iNaturalist all around the country this month. So this is one way to make a quick project if you want to study or get an un a better understanding of where the red-tailed hawks are being seen or who's seeing them uh, or how often they're being seen. I'm going to go ahead and delete that project because we don't need it going on right now. I'll do it later. Um, yeah, so that's how you can create projects. Again, you don't, you, anybody can create a project um, and you can choose to, if your goal is to get more people engaged, then you might want to make people join the project in order to have their observations count. Again, that's how we've done it with our projects on iNaturalist here. Um, or you can just create a project to collect a bunch of specific data if you're curious about where certain animals are being found more often. Um, one last thing you can do is message people. So iNaturalist is, a, is really a, a, like a social network in a way. So there's a community. All the users can message each other. And that can be really important for, um, for helping you learn more about the species that you're, you don't quite know. So on my personal account, I've messaged a lot of people that I see 
um, identifying things that I don't know. And I've asked them for help identifying a certain bee or something or a species like that. So it's a great way to connect. And then, and then you're able to find people who share some of those same interests as you um, and messaging with them. Uh, it's also from, our standpoint, it's been a good way to connect with other users on iNaturalist to join some of our projects, and they've been really engaged in those projects after we've messaged them. So it's been um, an effective tool, messaging, uh, and it can be a good way to connect with others. Uh, so let me just check my list, make sure I ran through the right things. All right. One thing. Another thing that's important for getting a good identification is making sure you can take a good picture. And for the most part, our cell phones are good, definitely good enough to take identifiable pictures of things, but it really depends on what you're taking a picture of. If it's a plant or a small thing that you can get your camera close to, you can probably take a great picture. Um, other times, if it's a bird flying by or perched far away, it might be too difficult to get a good photo. So you might have to think about other ways to get um, a good photo. Maybe it's taking it from a standalone camera, or maybe you can take a, a, a picture and then record a little bit of the song that it's singing. And all those can help, um, can help make your observation stronger and more identifiable for people. Um, okay. Let me go back. So besides iNaturalist, we do have a bunch of other community science projects. iNaturalist is, is kind of a new thing we've been rolling out just since, uh, since the summer started. So there's a lot of new stuff that we're gonna be rolling out on it for different projects, um, but we'd love for people to be involved in that as much as they can, as much as they'd like to be. Um, but we also have some other projects that uh, you can find online. If you just Google CT Deep community science, you'll come up with our webpage that has different volunteer opportunities where you can help us to study some of the wildlife in Connecticut. Um, a couple of them I'll run through real quick. We have the turkey brood survey that runs from June 1st to August 31st. And that is looking to get counts of all of the hen turkeys, so the female turkeys, and their poults, the young of the year, the ones that are were born um, in late May at, or in early June and are growing as they, um, as they do through the end of the summer. So if you see any, any hens and poults, we want those to be reported to us. You can find the f information for that, again, at, at the website we have here. Our bobcat, bear, moose sightings can also be reported online. We have a brand new database to, to enter those sightings. Um, it, we would also like if you're going to post them on iNaturalist, we definitely would like them posted on our um, agency website because these sightings go right to our biologists, which are actually keeping track of those for other purposes. So um, the map on the right is actually our moose sighting. So we have a new um, mapping system for moose, bear, and bobcat sightings. So you can, again, find that following the, um, the website here, Community Science Opportunities. Fisher sightings, those can be sent to this email address where we take those directly to the biologists about where we find Fisher. And then the CT bird atlas is still going on. So we have some other non iNaturalist projects uh, that you can also get involved with on the community science side. Um, so I'll take some questions in a little bit, but um, again, running through, we have new projects that we're adding over, over, Pretty much all the time now we're going to be adding several more as we get more people involved um, again we just started this, um, this this project about a month ago or so so it's still new to us we're still getting it off the ground um, but if you're going to join one project join our umbrella project the discover outdoor connecticut project because that will be your link to all the other um, projects that we create afterwards um, some of the projects that we're going to create are going to be open-ended they're going to have, they're just going to go on and on and on. Other projects like uh, our bio blitz, those things are going to be more discreet and um, have a, a limited time frame where we can try and get as many observations within a certain period of time. Um, so 
stay tuned for more of that stuff. All right, so I will take some questions. Okay, I have some questions for you, Kyle. All right. So if, can you add a second image or a recording or upload a video to an observation? Yes, so I can, I can pop back onto iNaturalist there and do that. So if I go back to the uploader, I'm just going to pull up some pictures that I can drag a bunch on. And I'll, I'll show you how to move those around. All right, so I'm adding five or six, a bunch of pictures. I just dragged these over from my desktop. I took these pictures this morning, or this after, earlier this afternoon. Um, these four pictures here of a bumblebee were all the same bumblebee I took at the same time. If, um, if some of the, unfortunately they're all from the same angle, I just grabbed them quickly. But if they're from a different angle, that might help identify them better. Let me see, pull one more up. You can grab them and move them into the same observation. And then these two bees, this is the same bee. Again, I took a different picture. So now I have two observations with multiple pictures in each. So I can click through. And so all these pictures will get stored with that one observation. And then both of these pictures will get stored with that observation. Yep. That's great. So I do know that when it comes to bumblebees, it's really good if you get a, you can get a, um, a photo of the bee to see the hairs on different parts of the, of the abdomen, but also if you can get a picture of the face. So that might be a good example of when a couple observations will help the um, specialist identify your bee to species. Right. Yep. So the more angles you can get, the better. Yeah, exactly. Now, if you join the Umbrella Project um, for CT Fish and Wildlife, um, Discover Outdoor Connecticut, will you get a notification by email if a new project is set up under that umbrella? It depends on your settings. Um, you, on my personal account, it sends me kind of an iNaturalist update every day or so. Um, and so the people that I follow on my, the other users that I follow, it'll give me an update on things that they've posted. Um, and then it will also send an update about, um, about new projects or, or something. So in this case, I just wrote uh, a new post for the Discover Outdoor Connecticut project that talks about the different, the, some of the new projects um, in the journal. Oh, not projects. So you'll get a notification when, uh, depending on your, your settings on your account, You'll get a notification when um, updates get posted to a journal or if yeah, if the new project started or new observations. So it does depend on your, um, your settings that you put in. You can, if you don't want to be bothered with emails every day, once a day, um, you can opt out of those. Okay. And then also if someone identifies your observation, you could get an email for that too, right? I believe so. I, when If you check it regularly, you know, I, I go on once a day or so, and you'll see up on the right here, the messages, and then this is where you'll get people who, it'll let you know if somebody added an identification to an observation that, I, that you've made. Okay. So this is a list of, of people that have um, added identifications to fit to my observations. 
Okay, so, and I, I noticed before when you were showing the barred owl photographs that the photos didn't necessarily have to be the most perfect, correct? To be research grade, aren't they just as long as they can be identifiable? Right, yep, they can, they can be, you know, a cell phone, blurry cell phone shot, but as long as you can tell, others can tell what it is, then that's all you need. Okay, so suppose, say some te Connecticut teachers and maybe some Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts wanted to participate in these projects. If they ended up doing their observations, perhaps this summer, could they join some of these projects and still have those photos count? Yes. yes. Yep, there will be, let's see, echoing. Um, yeah, if, as long as it fits in the criteria of the project, in other words, the, pri the criteria for the main wildlife project that we have, the criteria is it's any plant or animal that was observed after the project started. So in this case, we made it July 1st. Um, any, if you've joined the project, those observations will automatically get added to it. Okay, so if you join a project, you can see what the criteria um, is for that project. Yes. So when you go to the, uh, the read more, here's some information about the project and the criteria for it. So all taxa, it had to be in Connecticut. In this case, for this project, we've made it, you have to join the project in order to get your observations added to it. Um, and it, research grade, or if it needs an ID that can be added, and then any media type. So if you just have a sound, an audio file, that's okay. Um, that obviously is very important. If, you're, if you have a frog or some animal that you hear at night, but you don't actually get to see, um, adding an audio file is a great way to do that. And then we started the project for July 1st. So any observation before that won't be added to it, but any observation after that will. Okay. Okay, and then when you, go ahead and you submit an observation from your phone, I've noticed that sometimes your latitude and longitude comes in automatically. Is that the case just with your iPhone or your, your smartphone? It will all depend on whether you have uh, your privacy and location settings on your phone and on your computer. So if you are in um, a private browsing window on your computer, it's probably not going to automatically give you a correct date and time. Um, it may not add it. And sometimes it depends on the photo as well. Sometimes um, the, that information is stored in the photo itself, it, along with it as metadata. And when you upload that photo, it will automatically read the date and time location. But it's important to double check and just make sure that it's correct or that it's as precise as you would like it to be. You don't have to have it show a pinpoint of exactly where you saw this, because that could include your backyard and maybe you don't want people to know exactly where your backyard is. Um, so you can widen it out and just, and just have it be to the zip code or just to a larger radius of an area. Um, so before you submit, just double check those things and make sure that they are correct and it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. And someone was wondering how long it usually takes to get an identification. From my experience so far using iNaturalist, um, it depends on the type of animal there or, or plant. There are some people who are really dedicated and they just, they love to just identify things. Um, so some ter certain kinds of butterflies get identified really fast. Um, Bees can be fast and uh, depends on the quality too. Some people, as they're scrolling through the identify fields, if it's a picture they can't quite figure it out, they'll kind of pass and move on to the next one. If it's something that's more clear to them, then they'll probably, they're more likely to go and uh, give it an ID. Okay. I have one last question on my end and this was regarding when you did that search to find out how many red-tailed hawks were found in the region. Could you actually limit, limit your search to something like red-tailed hawks in New York? Yes, yes. And I, can, 
I can walk mm -hmm. us through that real quick. In the Explorer section, you can go into filter or we can, if we just want to do a species and location, we can do red tail hawk in New York. And this is in the grid view, a list of all the red tail hawk observations on iNaturalist. We could add a date criteria if we just wanted to know all the winter observations or all the ones um, this year, we could limit, we could, we could filter that stuff out in filters. We can also view a map view. And this is where all of the observations have come from. That's great. So again, if you say you wanted to filter for date, um, you can go to a date range let's just say in the last year. Update the search. And it changed the number of observations. Great. Okay, well, this has been extremely informative, Kyle, and I think it'll be nice to have so many other people joining in and, and submitting observations for many of our projects. Yeah, and I would like to add one other thing. If you are on iNaturalist, you can look us up, our username up, and you can send us a message if you run into issues or you have a question on something, you can write to us right here in iNaturalist. Um, and we can give you more specific help or answer questions if you need it. Um, just look for our username. You can just type in the username actually right here. CT Fish and Wildlife, it'll pop up. You can, oops. You can look at the observations we've made or you can look up the about. If you click about, it'll bring you to this page and then you can message people. Um, I'm going to look up myself just to show you what it'll look like from the other end. All right, so you can message someone directly right here, message, or you can follow them. And this is how I get updates about some of the people that I follow. Um, when they add new observations or write a post or get tagged in something, um, it'll send me a notification about that. But if you just want to send a message to to us here to, at CT Fish and Wildlife, you would just create a message here, type your message, you can preview it, and then hit send. And then we'll get back to you on that. Again, th this not to this account. This is my personal page, just as an example. Um, send it to CT Fish and Wildlife. Excellent. Okay, at this point, I'll send this over to Sue. All right. Well, if anybody has any last minute questions, you can certainly um, put it into the chat. Or if you wanted to email, you can email me at susan.quincy ct at ct.gov. And I will pass the questions on to Kyle or to Laura. For additional programs this week, we have coming up the Eastern Coyote on Wednesday and on Saturday. We also have the Monarch, uh, Monarch program, Saturday morning at 10. So if you are interested in those, you can find more information on the DEEP calendar of events, as well as Facebook pages on how to register. Or again, you can just ask me directly and I will send you links or put your name on the list for you. Uh, I'd li like to also give some notice for an upcoming program that is the 110th Plant Science Day at the Ag Experiment Station. This year it will be a virtual Ag Science Day, so hopefully more people will be able to participate, hear from speakers about agriculture, environmental issues, and say health and safety, as well as take part of some virtual activities. So thank you very much to Kyle and to Laura for presenting today, and I hope everyone has a nice afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.